Uh, today we're going to be starting our new series looking at the book of Acts and uh, that's an exciting time. Uh, this is a, a natural overflow of uh, our series of walking in the spirit and now we're just going to be seeing how the apostles did just that. And throughout this series in Acts we're going to be focusing our attention upward upon God uh, but also outward in gospel love for our neighbour that we might be filled up in order to be sent out. And the book of Acts uh, is usually given the title the Acts of the Apostles but many suggest that perhaps a better title might be the Acts of Jesus and the Spirit. And that's because the main focus of this book is on how Jesus and the Spirit are working through believers in the world. And Acts begins in chapter 1 verse 1 saying, In my first book I told you, Theophilus, about everything that Jesus began to do and teach. And here the author Luke is referring to his gospel with the implication that Jesus is continuing to do and teach. He hasn't stopped, he's continuing. And the gospel of Luke is only the beginning. To quote C.S. Lewis, Aslan is on the move. And Luke is referred to by Paul uh, in Colossians 4.14 and Philemon 24 as a beloved doctor and a co-worker. He's therefore thought to have been a medical doctor who travelled with Paul on many of his missionary journeys. And scholars are divided about just whether Luke had originally been a Hellenized, that's a Greek uh, encultured Jew, or as a Greek sort of God-fearer, someone who's uh, a non-Jew but worships the God of Israel. And as Paul nears the very end of his life in the Roman jail, he writes in Second Timothy that only Luke is with him. And this shows the devotion of Luke to Paul, that he would follow him all the way to Rome because he wanted to be with him. And Luke writes to Theophilus, and the name means a friend of God. And it's been interpreted as either a personal name or as a title. Now, some think that he was a wealthy Jew from Alexandria in Egypt, one of the very centres of Judaism at this time. But others say that he could have been a Roman official or perhaps even Paul's lawyer in prison, whilst others maintain that he was Theophilus ben Annas, the high priest in the temple in Jerusalem from 37 to 41 AD. Whoever he was, in all likelihood, he's also Luke's benefactor, providing Luke with a, a form of income in order that, or a form of livelihood, so that he could carefully search, uh, research, and then write the gospel in Acts. And together, those two books account for 27% of the New Testament, making Luke the largest single author within the New Testament. In his gospel in Luke 1, 3, he writes, having carefully investigated everything from the very beginning, I've also decided to write an accurate account for you, most honourable Theophilus. As such, we can see here that Luke intends for his gospel and for Acts in order to be a carefully investigated and account of events that have already taken place. As such, he's not only a doctor, but also a historian. He says in Luke 1 verse 2 that he is sought out eyewitnesses to the events. So what might the overall message of Luke's Gospel and Acts be, uh, particularly Acts? And it is this, that the story of how God's kingdom has come on earth through Jesus, his spirit and his community. Uh, Tim Mackey from the, the Bible Project puts it this way. Luke calls for faithfulness to Jesus as king, sharing the good news in word and action, forming diverse communities where all people are treated as equals and trusting in power and the guidance of the spirit in everyday lives. So reading Acts, therefore, should be a challenge for each of us about the message. 
about the message um, that we're sharing with people and the people that we come into contact with. Many of us grew up perhaps with the, the four point gospel message. God loves me. I've sinned. Jesus died for me. And I need to decide what I am going to do about that. And that's a good message that tells you how to get saved. But that isn't the good news that the apostles are sharing here when they preach in Acts. OK, uh, I've sat down, I've read all of the sermons in Acts. I've made notes of their contents and I recommend each of you to do the same. Just go through the book of Acts, look at all the sermons. What's the message that the apostles are sharing? And I'm just going to share with you my summaries now of the good news that Luke is recording the apostles having preached. And the message is different to Jews and to non-Jews. To the Jews, a summary would be something like this. Number one, Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises given to Israel. Number two, Jesus, the Nazarene, who was killed, has been raised. Number three, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God and has poured out the Spirit. Number four, that Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. Number five, repent and turn to God and your sins are going to be forgiven. They, they'll be forgiven. So that's a sort of five point message for the Jews. So to non-Jews, the message is similar, but it's, it's also different. To the non-Jews, the message is the true God is the maker of the heavens and the earth. This God does not have favourites, but rather welcomes all those who want to do what is right. That Jesus, the Nazarene who was killed, has now been raised. And Jesus has been appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. So that there will be a judgment day and everyone is going to have to give account of what they've done. And Jesus, the one who's been raised from the dead, he's the one who will be the judge. Um, number five, that all of that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises that have been given to Israel. And number six, repent and turn to God and your sins will be forgiven. So did you sort of catch the message? The good news is about who Jesus is, about who this Jesus is, that the focus is all on Jesus. And it's easy to see how that message became the Apostles' Creed, because the Apostles' Creed in many ways is just a summary of the preaching of the Apostles. And when speaking to Jews, notice that the Apostles don't talk about judgment or wrath. The Jews already know about judgment day they know that there will be an end of days reckoning the day of the lord they they know that already they don't need to be told about that but to the gentiles they are told that there there is jesus's judge that the day of the lord is coming and you need to repent and turn to god and that this jesus of nazareth is the jewish messiah and he's the one who will be the judge turn away from your idolatry turn to the one true god who is the god of israel they need to turn from their idols to the living God. It's about who are they believing in? Who are they trusting in? And to the Jews, the apostles say clearly that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God and has poured out the spirit. They're uh, saying in a very Jewish way that Jesus is God. He is God. The, the Messiah is Yahweh who has come. To both the Jews and the non-Jews, a central element of the good news is that the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, the fulfillment of Israel's story, is now found in Jesus the Messiah. Israel's Messiah has now come. So just think for a moment, if, you, if you're sat at work or if you're wherever you might be with a friend or, or with your family and you're sharing the gospel with them, would you mention that the good news of the promises made in angels ages past to Israel have now been fulfilled in the resurrection of the Messiah. Is that something that you would share? If not, why not? OK, it's a question. It's a piercing question for all of us to ask. If we say these things challenge us because we, we don't have a deformed gospel, we want to be sharing the same message that the apostles shared, don't we? We want the truth. In Acts 13, 32, 33, we read and we proclaim to you the good news about the promise to our ancestors that this promise has fulfilled 
being fulfilled, that this promise God has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus from the dead. I'm just going to read that again from Acts 13. And we proclaim to you the good news about the promise to our ancestors, that this promise God has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. OK, so the good news is about promises that have been fulfilled in Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, Acts 26, 6. And Paul says, now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise God made to our ancestors. He's on trial because of the promise. Uh, Acts 26, 20. Paul says, I declared to those in Damascus first then in Jerusalem, Judea, to all the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds that are consistent with repentance. So it's not just about saying, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me just say a prayer. It's about performing deeds that are also consistent with our repentance, changing our way of life, having a complete change of heart in how we do things, knowing that there will be a day of judgment and we will have to face Jesus, who is the king. Uh, when talking to King Agrippa, Paul says in Acts 26, 27, do you believe the prophets, King Agrippa? Do you believe the prophets? That's Paul's question. He's saying, King Agrippa. Do you believe the prophets? Because the promises have now been fulfilled. Paul wants all those Jews in the court of the king to know the promises have now come to pass. Death has been overthrown. The, the, the resurrection is the first of many. The, this good and most excellent news is that the promised Messiah has come. The promised kingdom has come, but it's a kingdom not of this world. The restored temple is here, but it's a temple not built with human hands, but the body of the Messiah. OK, his people who are now being indwelt by this spirit. And you, O oh listener, can join this. You, O oh listener, can have a part in this. Former Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright and scholar on Paul, um, in his biography of Paul says what drove Paul from the moment on the Damascus road and throughout his subsequent life was the belief that Israel's God had done what he always said that he would. That Israel's scriptures had been fulfilled in ways never before imagined and that the temple and the Torah themselves were not after all these ultimate realities, but instead glorious signposts pointing to the new heaven and earth reality that has come in Jesus so Acts is a story about how Jesus and the Spirit, through the apostles and the church, are bringing all nations into this reality of the kingdom of Christ. A kingdom not of this world. And friends, you too can join that kingdom. You too become part of that spiritual temple, a place where God is choosing to dwell in your hearts. The King Jesus has come and he's, it can, will come again in the future, riding on the clouds. But he, he's come and he can come into your heart. OK, he can come to dwell there because sin has been dealt with. Sin has been dealt with on the cross. And it's not outward, you know, a sprattering of blood to make the temple clean, but rather an inward cleansing of your heart so that God can dwell in your heart. Paul in Galatians 3, 8 writes, what's more, the scriptures look forward to a time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. And God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said all nations will be blessed through you. So, friends, Paul's understanding is that this good news that the promises to Israel have been fulfilled in Israel's Messiah is the blessing that all the nations need to hear. The nations have been made right in the eyes of God through Israel's Messiah. Acts is the story of good news. This good news of promises fulfilled is going to the nations. And it should be noticed that Acts covers the first 30 to 35 years of church history. The account begins with the ascension of Christ, perhaps around the year 333 AD, and runs all the way through to 62, 64 AD with Paul in Rome. And so although we can read it in an hour, an hour and a half or whatever, it's actually covering the span of 30 to 35 years. And the first section of the book of Acts is the focus is on Peter. And as the story progresses, the focus shifts to Paul. And we're given the story of the first Christian martyr 
and the debates about how Jewish the non-Jewish followers of a Jewish Messiah need to become. Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to, to obey all the co kosher laws? Do, you know, how Jewish do they need to become? And we have the conversion story of Paul and his free missionary journeys to spread the good news of promises fulfilled in the Messiah to the nations. And in Acts, um, it's been noticed that Luke uh, seeks to portray Paul as a, a sort of Moses in some ways to the non-Jews. Both had the best education uh, as a child, either in Pharaoh's palace or under Gamaliel. Uh, both were involved in murder, Moses as a murderer, and Paul approved of Stephen's killing and then he hunts down Christians. Both of them encountered Jesus as a light in the wilderness and both were commissioned to therefore go and set the captives free. Paul recalls his... Um, Conversion in Galatians 1, 17 to 18, he said, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia and later returned to the city of Damascus. So like Moses, Paul met with Christ on Mount Sinai in Arabia. And this is important for us to know who Paul thought Jesus was, um, because when we read Paul's writings, we see that he, he, he speaks these wonderful things about Christ, that he's the visible image of the invisible God. And um, for Paul, Jesus was the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, who was also God. He's known by many names in the Old Testament, the word, the name, the glory, the face, the right hand. He's the visible image of the invisible God. And Jesus says as much. He says, you know, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. You know, he's the visible image of the invisible God. And Paul in Galatians 4, 14 writes, Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Jesus Christ himself. Uh, notice how Paul parallels the angel of God with Jesus Christ. And in calling Paul, um, Jesus an angel, he's not saying that he's a created being or he's somehow lesser than God, because the angel of the Lord is God. Angel means simply messenger. And so we shouldn't be really sort of apologetic or, or worried about that, because um, the author of Hebrews goes to great lengths to show that Jesus is superior to all the angels. He's superior to any created being because he's uncreated. He's very God from God, light from light. He's superior to all the angels. But Paul writes in First Thessalonians 4, uh, 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So when he returns, he will do so in power as the visible image of the invisible God with the voice of an archangel surrounded by saints. And whenever the angel of the Lord shows up in the Old Testament, when he speaks, it, it's God speaking. Remember, angel just means messenger here. He's has the power to, um, to make covenants and to break them. He can forgive sins and he receives worship. There are things that none of the other angels can do. In 1 Corinthians 10.4, Paul describes Christ as the spiritual rock that followed the Israelites, drawing upon this idea of the angel of the Lord with the people as they travelled in the desert. And when the Israelites did not heed the word of the Lord in Exodus 23.21, Paul writes, they put Christ to the test and they were destroyed by serpents. So Paul here clearly sees Jesus in the Old Testament because of the words of Jesus in John 5, 39. The scriptures point to me. In Exodus 3, 2, we read the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from within a bush. Verse 5, God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sands, sandals off your feet for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And he adds, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. But notice what Moses sees. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the bush. And yet when the angel speaks, he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. 
the angel of the Lord is the visible Yahweh. He's the visible image of the invisible God. So when Paul encounters that bright light on the road to Damascus, he has a revelation of who Jesus of Nazareth really was. He was one and the same as the one who had spoken to Moses from the bush. He was God, the angel of the Lord, the word had been born of a virgin of the line of David. He was the Messiah, the same one who had walked with Adam in the garden, spoken with Abraham and with Moses, had once again stepped into Israel's story to do something amazing and wonderful. Just as he had been with Israel as a cloud and a flame in the wilderness, now he would be with them and in them by the Spirit. And as Paul would later write in Colossians 1, 27, and this is the secret that Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So Paul shares his conversion and commission in Acts 26 this way in verses 13 through to 18. He says, about noon, your majesty, I was on the road and a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. And we all fell down and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one who is you are the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as my witness and my my servant and witness to tell people that what you have seen. Tell them that I will show you in the future and I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Open their eyes that they may turn to light from the power of Satan to God. And they will receive forgiveness for their sins and given a place amongst God's people who are set apart by faith in me. Like Moses, Paul, a murderer, meets that angel of the Lord. Christ himself, the visible image of the invisible God, as light in the wilderness. And like Moses, is given a mission to call people out of slavery from the power of of Satan to God, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Friends, when we're looking at Acts, we should remember that none of the players involved thought of themselves as part of a new religion called Christianity. They were Jews and non-Jews who worshipped Israel's God and had come to a realisation that the God of Israel had suddenly and dramatically acted in human history in fulfilment to Israel's promise And as such, the whole world needed to know about this good news because it's good news for all. God had begun the restoration of all things through the death and resurrection of Israel's Messiah. The nations could now turn to God. The the demons, the powers and principalities who ruled over the nations had been disarmed. And so in conclusion, friends, Acts is the story of how Jesus and the Spirit, through the apostles and the church, are bringing all nations into this new reality, this already present and yet not fully here kingdom of God, a kingdom not of this world. Friends, you too can join the kingdom. It is at hand. You too can become part of the spiritual temple, a place where God dwells in your heart, as prophesied by Jeremiah. When he said, I will put my instructions deep within them, I will write on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So Jesus Christ has come and is coming soon. Judgment day is at hand. Repent and turn to him. We'll be exploring some more of these themes in the next few weeks. Thank you for listening.